Primetime News with Israel Lai. Good evening and welcome to the Primetime News. My name is Israel Lai. Stories making the headlines. Day two of vetting ends with the ministers designate for roads and highways. Agriculture. Information and lands and natural resources taking their turns to answer probing questions from the appointment committee. Chief of Staff of Swabani sets up high-level working group to address concerns of aggrieved teachers in the country ahead of Nagrat's intended strike on Monday. We'll find out how workable this will be. We'll bring you a special report on how it feels to be on the way for blood to save lives due to a shortage at the blood bank. In business, global tech producer Samsung has placed Ghana as one of its priority markets in Africa for 2013, while Nigeria and Kenya remain Samsung's biggest markets on the continent. In showbiz, we'll explore the craze for natural hair and what informs ladies to go kinky. The more plus the AFCOM updates and interesting results coming up in the bulletin. In our very first story, Vice President Kwesi Misaatha has challenged the Ghana Armed Forces to continue to cooperate with the police to combat, co to combat armed robbery and other criminal vices. He joined members of the forces at Burma Camp in Accra as they celebrated the West African Security Activities Day and launched the 8th French to English Memoir. To be able to communicate with their counterparts in other countries when they go on peace operations. So with these few words that I launched the 8th Memoir French to English for the Ghana Armed Forces. It is a day for the men and women in uniform to socialize, take stock and rekindle themselves for the task of protecting the country ahead. It is done annually. Chief of Staff at the General Headquarters, Commodore Viacro, said in spite of the sophistication in criminal activities, the Ghana Armed Forces is determined to continue fighting crime and respond to national emergencies. The status of armed forces in contemporary times has expanded beyond a pure security institution to include a major economic and diplomatic resource for countries. It is in this light that we applaud the demonstrated commitment of the government of Ghana to modernize the Ghana Armed Forces. We are most grateful, but like Oliver Twist, we need more, sir. He urged the public to volunteer information to assist them continue fighting crime to keep Ghana safe. Vice President Kwesi Emisa Arthur said Ghana was grateful for their critical assistance during national disasters, especially the professionalism shown during the plane crash and the Malcolm disaster. Many people have also observed a significant improvement in cooperation and understanding between the civilian population and the Ghana Armed Forces. This is indeed laudable, but there is certainly room for improvement, and I urge you to consciously work at this. I acknowledge that there are still challenges in terms of equipment and accommodation. So these other things will continue or will begin to receive the attention of government from this year. Let me wish that your efforts and our efforts will continue to create a stable, democratic and prosperous Ghana. Major Fiamagbe was awarded 3,000 US dollars and a fully funded trip to France for excelling in the newly added French language program. Two civilian workers, Jonathan Nati and Vaida Edu, who had worked 42 and 37 years with the forces respectively, were also honored.
A member of the ruling National Democratic Congress, NDC Alhaji Bello, has secured an injunction against the conduct of the Boehm constituency by-election, which was due to be held today. The injunction is believed to be linked to the disqualification of eight to former President Rawlings, Kofi Adams, from contesting the by-elections. Let's get on to the phone lines now and get to speak to the voter regional chairman of the NDC, George Awaji. Good evening, sir, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, and good what? wishes to our listeners in Ghana. Okay. And my name is Kwesi Abuaji Rala, not George. All right. Thank you very much for the correction. So this injunction you're talking about, do you have any idea why this, who is seeking this injunction and uh, or why this injunction is being sought? Uh, in, uh, in sincerity, it, it, the constituency chairman from the constituency who called yesterday night to inform me about the whole procedure. And uh, it was my own research that showed that it was one of Haji Bello whose cup of tea is caught. This is about the third time he's taking the party in the constituency to court. We have been able all the time to, to weather the storm. And uh, you see, NBC is a large family, but very nucleated. So we don't drag our matters too much into the public. And we always rule on consensus. And so with this particular thing, it is true that we heard of the injunction, but have been trying talking a lot, and he himself, and the man for whom he said he's fighting has categorically said that he doesn't want to take the party to court again. He doesn't want to pull the matter beyond this level. He, Kofi Adams, is prepared to bid his time. Okay, Mr. Mr. Waji, so that goes to confirm that indeed uh, the injunction is being sought or the injunction is in connection with the disqualification of uh, Kofi Adams. Actually, from what uh, the lawyers are telling me, that statement which the chairman read to me is not to be an injunction. It's only an intention to move the motion in court on Tuesday for the court to slap the injunction. So they thought it was an injunction. It is only on Tuesday. And it was on that basis that after a lot of talking, we have all agreed. And all being well, tomorrow we will have the primaries uh, in the constituency. All right. So the primary was supposed to have been held today. Yes. So but why wasn't it held if it wasn't an injunction? It wasn't. No, no, no. You know, I'm telling you that when they, they, they communicated the message to me, I thought it was an injunction secured from court. But later on, when legal people were telling the situation, it is only on Tuesday that the motion was going to be moved in court for the judge to slap the injunction on us. So there is no injunction in effect. It's, it's interesting, uh, Mr. Bwaje, that... Uh, Based on hearsay, you decided to call off a primary that had been scheduled when you had not seen any injunction. Honestly, you see, when the man spoke to me and I asked him whether he had received the, the, the document, say yes. And to avoid court contempt of court, which is, uh, 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 doesn't even go with a, a fine, I thought it wise to avoid, because they have also sent a literal permission who definitely not come if we haven't cleared the air. But now that it is true that it is only on Tuesday that the proper, and the parties concerned have been able to talk to them, we have all come into agreement. The bellow man himself, he said no, he will talk to the lawyers to withdraw the case. So we have settled the matter, and uh, on Sunday we're going to have the primaries. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bwaje is the voter regional chairman of the NDC, and he was telling us that the uh, primary scheduled for the Boehm constituency, which was postponed uh, as a result of what he thought was an injunction, will actually come off tomorrow. Now, President Mahama has arrived from a three-day official visit to Turkey at the invitation of his Turkish counterpart, President Abdullah Gol. The invitation was extended during his visit to Ghana in 2011. President Mahama arrived on board a Turkey Air flight at about 8.20 p.m. last night. Whilst in Turkey, he encouraged Turkish investors to turn an eye to Ghana, met with the Ghanaian community and urged Turkey to help Ghana in electricity generation. He was met on arrival by Vice President Kwesi Emisa Arthur and other government officials, as well as flag bearer of the PNC in the last year's election, Hassan Ayarega. 
We're taking a break now, but we have more stories coming up. Don't go away. The Board of Directors of the Kolubu Teaching Hospital says it is receiving threats from some dismissed employees of the hospital and their allies. The issue of the threats came up at a news briefing to reveal ongoing restructuring processes at the hospital. The threats come in the wake of the dismissal of former Director of Administration. Some allies are calling for his reinstatement. At a press briefing Friday afternoon, Board Chairman Edward Annan showed pressmen some of the threats that the board has been receiving from some of the dismissed employees. Other members also confirmed some of these threats. They called me personally to threaten me. So they write all kinds of stories about me to just tarnish my image because I have done one thing. The board chairman also debunked allegations that the hospital had taken delivery of expired drugs. It was true that there was a consignment which had expired delivered to Kolebu. But Kolebu didn't order it. Kolebu didn't pay for it. And the supplier was made aware of that. The supplier came back and took the items away. It's different if after going through the investigation, it was clear that Kolebu ordered those items, knowing that they were expired, asserted them expired, and put in the stores. Then, of course, Kolebu is done something wrong. Meanwhile, the board of directors say the hospital is undergoing a restructuring process, one of which is a computerized system which makes for easy flow of information. And a three-member committee has been formed to audit the different units in the hospital to bring out some of their fraudulent deals. That system, we all, including the government, we all know and believe that it, it has to be done for us to have a smooth run of, uh, of the institution. Now, we found so many orders placed, placed, without authority from the chief executive. Now, that's completely wrong. All this hamper the uh, smooth running of Kolebu. Board members say by close of day, it will file a report with the police. Now, the call to donate blood to the Kolebu Blood Bank is perhaps one of the most popular appeals on the airwaves. But the real question is, are Ghanaians donating enough blood to save lives in times of emergencies? Our reporter, Ya Fusua Jemfi, who spent a day at the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, tells the story of Linda Arthur, a 38-year-old woman who needed four pints of blood, but was lucky to get just a pint because the Kolibu Blood Bank simply does not have enough supplies. We're bringing you the story again because it was accidentally truncated yesterday. The Hematology Daycare Centre of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. It is here that hundreds of patients from all over the country trip to on a daily basis to seek blood. It was here I met Linda Arthur, a 38-year-old woman suffering from lymphoma, a disease associated with cancer of the blood. Linda was diagnosed with the ailment a year ago and ever since her diagnosis, the Kolebu Teaching Hospital has virtually become her second home. Linda had come all the way from Kumasi for her chemotherapy treatment, but her treatment has been truncated because she's not able to secure the required amount of blood needed to aid her speedy recovery. Linda looks tired and weak, and even though she has the money to buy all the blood she needs, she cannot get the commodity because there is lack of it at the hospital. <laughs> Blood. <laughs> Her sister Bertha, who had accompanied Linda to the hospital, could not help but share her frustration. I don't know what we will do. Blood, no, so, and Sana, yeah, be my opinion, just a word donate be. And Sana, when you be, say, I call most blood in a binny hole, to just so many be replaced, and Sana, I'm waiting, Mama, you be. Tears flowed freely from Linda's eyes when she told me the tax of getting blood from the blood bank has not been an easy one to end her battle with cancer. She is encouraging everyone to take the time to donate and help others like her who is in need of blood. 
The Accra Blood Bank is one of the major sources of blood in the country. On a daily basis, the center needs between 600 to 700 pints of blood to cater for the teeming number of cases in the various hospitals, but now it can only afford to give out 100 pints. And this is because the demand for blood compared to blood donation at the center is high. Head of the Accra Blood Unit at Kolibu, Dr. Paul Mensa, was worried public volunteerism of blood donation has slowed considerably, accounting for the reason why Linda and hundreds of other patients at the hospital do not have the blood they desperately need. There are situations where people might come in, they may be typed as a particular blood group, say O negative, and then the blood bank finds that we do not have O negative blood. So such situations arise and then we have to fall on other hospitals that do collection of blood to see if they could help. But all this would stop if um, <laughs> more people donated because it stands to reason that the more people donate, the, the, the higher your assurance that all the different blood groups will be available at any one time. Even though the situation improved, we are still not operating at maximum stock levels yet. So we're still asking Ghanaians to consider it um, uh, as, as, a, as a, it's all of us a collective responsibility to be able to keep the blood stock levels up. Linda's predicament to some may just be another ordinary case of a patient who needs blood and cannot get it compared to the other cases at the hospital. But you may never know when you or your relative or maybe a friend would be in desperate need of blood to save his or her life. Volunteer blood donation at the Accra Blood Bank is on the decrease. Perhaps if corporate institutions, schools and the general public would make a conscious effort to donate blood to the hospital on a regular basis, thousands of lives that otherwise have needlessly perished because of the lack of blood could be saved. <laughs> The National Health Insurance Authority has announced that it will roll out captation nationwide soon after an independent group of consultants tasked to study the pilot in the Ashanti region presents its report. Captation is an additional provider payment mechanism which the authority believes will streamline payments and cut out corruption in the administration of the health insurance scheme. A statement issued by the NHIA states that an independent group of consultants has completed a study of the pilot in the Ashanti region and will make its findings and recommendations available to be discussed with healthcare providers and other stakeholders at a forum to be organized in the Ashanti region very soon. The pilot, which according to the NHIA is the initial, phase, initial part rather, of a phased nationwide implementation of the program, has been described by the authority as successful and which has provided useful lessons to inform plans for the second phase of implementation across the country. There was some chaos at the WA Municipal Assembly Hall where members of the Assembly gathered in an emergency session to elect two representatives for next month's Council of State elections. The members were passionately divided over the nomination of the presiding member, Ibrahim Adam. Rafiq Salam's report from WA. You put it there, and we want the internal auditor to take charge of this exercise. The first motion in the one municipal assembly emergency session, which was fee fixing resolution, was passed without a hitch. But tempers fled when time came to choose two nominees for the upcoming Council of State elections. Some assembly members walked out after a motion was moved to appoint the presiding member, Ibrahim Adam, as an automatic representative. The assemblyman for Guli Konjihi Electoral Area Assembly, Shamsadin Nupayat, spoke to Joy News. The law states categorically that two representatives. So if others express interest in being nominated or elected to represent the assembly, the right to should have been that all those interested are made to contest. And the first and second place persons become the 
representatives of the assembly. Unfortunately, that was not done. The suggested, the suggestion was uh, taken upon a lot of objections from so many members, but we just had to deal with that. Many thought with this dust settled on the inclusion of the presiding member, electing a second representative would be an easier task, but it wasn't so. There were three nominees. Assemblyman for Kungu Parisaga Electoral Area, Saka Oluna, Assemblyman for Jonga Electoral Area, Ibrahim Dubile, and government's nominee, Memuna Mahama Ahasan. The one municipal chief executive directed the three contestants to leave the hall so they could vote using headcount. But this didn't go down well with the assemblyman for Limanyiri Nyairi electoral area, Muhaidin Yakubu. A secret ballot was proposed, so the assembly's opaque tender box was brought out. But again, members raised issues on the supervision and method of voting. After a heated debate, it was decided they would write the first name of their candidate on a piece of paper. When it was finally time to vote, two of the contestants, Saka Olona and Ibrahim Dubile, withdrew, paving the way for government nominee Memuna Mahamayaha to join the presiding member in next month's elections. The municipal chief executive was full of praise for the maturity exhibited by members of the assembly. The MPP is refusing to heed to pleas from sections of society to, to reconsider its MP's boycott of the vetting of ministers' designate. Now, the party took the decision after a meeting with the minority in parliament and has so far stayed away from proceedings of the appointment committee conducting the vetting. The Ghana Bar Association is one of several institutions and groups that have appealed to the MPP to rethink the decision in the interest of the state. The party in a letter to the GBN copied to join it, however, and says its position remains unchanged. The opposition NPP has been under pressure since the start of the year over its decision to boycott events associated with the Mahama administration. After boycotting the swearing-in of President Mahama and his vice, Papa Kwisi Misa Arthur, the NPP is now boycotting the vetting of the president's nominees for various ministerial positions. Some religious bodies have called on the party to rescind its decision. Pro-NPP pressure group, the Alliance for Accountable Governance, AFAC, has also described the party's boycott of the vetting as a shame. Social media has also been flooded with comments urging the NPP to rescind its decision of boycotting the vetting of ministerial nominees, but the party will not budge. There's a wall of difference between boycotting the process and declining to participate in the process. For example, like as I said, we are declining to, uh, to participate in the process of vetting the minister that have been nominated or any other minister that will be nominated within the period that the Supreme Court will rule, until such a time that the Supreme Court will rule. We will not uh, do that. But if the president were to, for example, nominate a Supreme Court judge or any other person who will at least his presidency if the Supreme Court were to rule, would, would take part and vet that kind of person. So I said, for example, we are, we are just not vetting or we are not just engaging ourselves in acts that the president, that will cease to exist when the president is no more president by the ruling of the Supreme Court, if okay. the Supreme Court were to uphold our petition. It, is, it doesn't mean that we will not do our legislative and oversight function. We will continue to do that. We are going to parliament, we will take part in the debates of, of parliament, we will do our oversight functions of parliament, we will do our legislative functions of parliament to satisfy our constituents. The letter signed by party chairman Jacob Echebilamte explains the decision is based on principles. It says, quote, reconciling our position to our local culture would be that if one is challenging the elevation of a paramount chief, one does not at the same time recognize such sub-chiefs as he may install, unquote. It indicates members of the NPP will be fully engaged in the work of parliament. Quote, they will be involved in all legislative functions and assist in carrying out parliament's oversight responsibility of the executive and public purse in the normal course of parliamentary business. NPP MPs will scrutinize and contribute to the making of the budget, study and help pass bills, 
and deliberate loan agreements and all financial transactions involving the state, unquote. But the NPP MPs will not be vetting the ministerial nominees because, according to Mr. Obeche Bilamte, quote, the minister's role is to assist the president in the performance of his functions. And since the legitimacy of the president's position is under challenge at the Supreme Court, participating in their vetting would be contradictory to the challenge, unquote. Meanwhile, four ministers designated nominated by President John Dramani Mahama have been vetted by the Appointment Committee of Parliament. There are four representing the Information, Roads and Highways, agri and Land and Natural Resources Ministries were grilled on the knowledge of their respective ministries, their competencies and the mission and vision statement for the various agencies and departments under those ministries. Each member designate spent an average of two hours answering questions from the members of the Appointment Committee. The first person to appear before the committee was the minister-designate for the Roads and Highways Ministry, Alhaji Amin Amidu Suleimani. Key among the questions asked the minister was how the road fund could be used to help in Ghana's road construction efforts and how road contractors could be promptly paid after completion of their work. Chairman, I want to uh, start by saying that uh, the road fund decentralization might not be favorable now in that roads are not district specific. Roads link districts, link regions, and uh, if we uh, decide to centralize it and it has reconstruction and the other districts are unable to, to link up, the roads may not even be able to, uh, you won't be able to move between districts and between regions. So I I'm a fan of decentralization because I've done most of my uh, political work in the region. But I think that for the road fund, I, I think it will be unadvisable at this point to decentralize. We haven't got that capacity now to be able to synchronize so that if Garu is working towards Boku, Boku is working, then you will link up. So that's why the road fund has a mandate to start from Boku to Garu. But it goes across the street. So I will not favor any decentralization of it. The competency of the minister designate was also put in question. Samuel Kujetu Ablakwa. Will you be kind to tell this committee what you think are the personal attributes you have that makes you best fit for minister for roads and highways? Looking at your CV also, you are a mechanical engineer, and this is an industry dominated by civil engineers. I would want to know from you whether you consider that a disadvantage or rather an advantage which can help you in the discharge of your duties. By saying I'm a mechanical engineer, I'm going to the road sector where it's in, uh, 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 basically they're all civil. I would say that if I were even in practice at my level, we don't do engineering, we do, we do management. And all those people at my level in the digital sector are managers. They don't do drawings and other things. We have, when you, engineering is a tool for management. It's not a tool for drawing and other things. Those who draw are there. We, once you become an engineer, you're a manager, and you can fit into any to whether civil, geotactic, electrical, because basically, we start engineering with the basic training. In those days that we were trained as engineers, we all did the same course, basically in the first year before we moved. But I'm not going there as an engineer, and I will not profess that I am going there as an engineer. I'm going to Minister of Roads and Highways, basically as a manager, not as an engineer. Al-Haji Suleimani also promised to enhance the capacity of local contractors by ensuring members enroll into the ministry's training school, whilst helping them to acquire machinery and equipment to enhance their work, if given the nod. The next person to appear before the appointment committee was the minister designate for the Food and Agricultural Ministry, Clement Kofi Humado. He immediately brought his expertise to bear as to how he would ensure food security in the country and assist local farmers have access to fertilizer to help increase their productivity. Try to aggregate livestock, particularly cattle, into confinements, confined areas. We need to demarcate special areas according to our land use for cattle and zone them so that uh, 
cattle should not stray into crop producing areas. And I'm aware that um, a project, project is, being, is, is being started somewhere in, uh, in, uh, in the Kwewu area, where uh, to, de to develop 245 hectares of uh, fodder pasture for uh, cattle farmers. I think this needs to be encouraged. And when given the nod, we will look at other areas of this country where this threat exists. On poultry, Clement Kofihumado noted it will help improve poultry farming in the country by identifying commercial farmers and outgrowers to plant yellow corn on large bases for the poultry farmers. Uh, yellow corn, soybean. Um, it is an area, when given the nod, I will engage NAFCO and its stakeholders. I think so far, from my examination, the model is right, and NAPCO is doing well, but they need to be assisted to expand. They need to increase their coverage all over the country in terms of warehousing, silos, drying facilities. And we, we need to make the LDCs, the local buying uh, companies, more efficient. He also promised to engage the youth prominently in the agri sector. Join us as a learned of some intervention by government to save off a threatening strike by members of the National Association of Graduate Teachers. Naira President Christian Adai Poku has confirmed the association's leaders together with their NAT counterparts met with the Chief of Staff, Bani Elia, today over their scheduled strike which was to have started next Monday, January 28. Narad had demanded that government resolve all outstanding disputes regarding their salaries and other conditions of services by close of day today. Reports have said the meeting resolved that a high-level working group be established to address the problems. Christian Dadai Poku now joins us live on the telephone for further details about this meeting. Good evening and thanks for joining us, uh, Mr. Dadai Poku. Good evening, Stevie. Now, okay, this is Israel. Now, well, does Israel. the resolution reached at the meeting also mean Monday strike has been called off? Yes, the National Council of Magras met today, and um, we considered um, proposals made by government, and um, we think that uh, we will want to give them the chance to look at the issue and deal with it. And so, the National Council agreed that uh, strike action should be suspended so that the government can go to work, and then the, all the stakeholders can come together and resolve the issue. You know, the issue, some of them have been pending for two years now, we have not been able to get people to even listen to us. And so I think it's really, really good that an opportunity has been created for us to be at least listened to. And when people listen to us and they understand our issues, I think um, solutions can be found to us. But I thought in recent times you've been on uh, journeys to talk about the fact that on countless occasions you've uh, reached such deals or resolutions with uh, the stakeholders and yet nothing comes out of it and that was the reason no. why you were insisting no. that you're going to go no. on this any time that we have um, raised issues like this um of it all we meet but then uh, normally at the gs level and they are they, they, they refuse i mean they they don't show commitment to the issues that they, they we all agree upon and that is why it has been a problem for us. As we speak, the Paper Commission has ruled on certain issues and mandated GES to go ahead, compelled GES to go ahead and then satisfy them. And those that the uh, Paper Commission has not touched on, that those are the issues that the group will sit down and discuss it at that level, see how issues can be resolved. All right. Thank you very much. That was Christian Adai Proku. He is the president of the National Association of Graduate Teachers. And the news is that they have called off an intended strike action to start from Monday after meeting with the chief of staff uh, at the castle uh, earlier today. Next up, we have business coming up.
Now, global tech producer Samsung has placed Ghana as one of its priority markets in Africa for 2013. Nigeria and Kenya remain Samsung's biggest markets on the continent in terms of volumes, but Ghana's recent performance in value compared to other African countries has attracted the attention of the company. According to Samsung, recent surveys show it is the market leader in phones in Ghana. Number one, value market share in smartphones, particularly TV and air conditioners. The company has significantly increased operational activities in the country in terms of presence, advertising and sales. It has also hinted of some new major projects in Ghana, South Africa, in Nigeria. Some of these include the Mobile Fun Zone, which is which is developed for the 2013 African Cup of Nations, but is expected to continue after the tournament. Samsung will also next month start the Chelsea Dream the Blues that will provide kids with global opportunities in, in football in Ghana, Nigeria and South Africa. Now, the closing date for implementing the eGana project has been extended to June 30 next year. The project will assist governments generate growth and employment.